Good evening, colleagues. We're just waiting for uh, the participants to join the um, the lecture. So we'll just give that a few minutes, and then we'll um, then we'll start. We've had an overwhelming response, so it may take a few moments um, for us to let them all in. Thank you, and then we can begin. Okay, Thiru, you just want to confirm we can go ahead? Yes, we can, Roshni. Okay, good, thank you very much. So good evening and a very warm welcome. You can, uh... can I go ahead? Yes, sorry, you can go ahead, Roshni. All right, good. So good evening and a very warm welcome to the Phyllis Snyder Memorial Lecture of Moshe Mashabela, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Research and Innovation at UKZN, members of the Executive Management, our guest speaker, Mr. Lakona Mguni, Mr. Joe Mshlanga, Mr. Buck Whaley, family of the late Dr. Phyllis Naidu, members of Senate, academics and professional staff, members of the Advisory Board, Gandhi Latuli Documentation Center, alumni, students, political, business, and religious leaders, the media, family, and friends, and distinguished guests, welcome. Just wanna take a few moments for housekeeping. Your microphone will be muted by default to help keep interruptions and background noise to a minimum. But when you want to talk, just raise your hands and we'll unmute you. Please write in the chat box and let us know if you're experiencing any issues and you're welcome to use the chat box throughout. So let's begin. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Prof. Musa Moshobela to present the welcome note for this lecture. He currently holds the position of Associate Professor and Acting Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Innovation at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. He was until December 2020, the Dean in the School of Nursing and Public Health at UKZN. He's a Chief Medical Specialist, having trained as a medical practitioner and specialized in family medicine and primary health care. As an esteemed academic, he has a Doctor of Philosophy degree in the field of public health with a specific focus on health systems and policy research. He further completed a Master's of Science in Demography and Health and a Master of Medicine and a Bachelor of Medicine in Surgery. He is at present the adjunct faculty and a Wellcome Trust Research Fellow at the Africa Health Research Institute in South Africa. His research portfolio in implementation science and health systems research cuts across multiple disciplines and involves the design, implementation, and evaluation of complex interventions in public health care services and programs. And this seeks to improve access, quality, and equity in health care in ways appropriate for resource poor settings in sub-Saharan Africa. Although his work has until recently been largely grounded in HIV and TB research. He is a family physician and a public health expert. He's currently leading a team to establish a new research institute focused on research for societal impact, the Institute of People-Centered Health. He was also until recently the convener of the COVID-19 response team at UKZM and is an advisor to the Department of Health provincially through the War Room for COVID-19 in the province of KwaZulu Natal, and nationally through the technical working group of the Ministerial Advisory Committee. Further, he's the chairperson of the Standing Committee on Health in the Academy of Science of South Africa and chairperson of the subcommittee to evaluate and report on the national health sector response to COVID-19 in South Africa. Internationally, he was a member from 2018 to 2020 of the Lancet Commission on Synergies between Health Promotion Universal Health Coverage and Global Health Security, and UCS National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Commission member on Human Resources for Health in Rwanda. This was from 2018 to 2020, and the Global Roadmap towards Health Longevity from 2019 to 2021 commissions. 
Most recently, he was the 2021 nominee for the Human Sciences Research Council Medal for Social Sciences and Humanities, Established Research Award, and Co-Principal Investigator on the winning team of the 2021 HSRC Medal for Social Sciences and Humanities Inaugural Team Award, together with Prof. Priscilla Reddy, in honor of the team's work concerning COVID-19 and the impact of South Africa's response to the pandemic. So over to you, Prof. Moshevela. Thank you very much, uh, Roshini, um, for that um, overly generous uh, introduction. Um, thank you kindly. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my greetings to all of you, ev every single one of you. Um, I, I would like to uh, particularly greet our uh, keynote uh, speaker for the day. Uh, I would like to, to greet uh, the family uh, of Dr. Phyllis Naidu. I would like to, to greet the advisory committee as well as uh, the Gandhi Lutuli uh, Documentation Center. I would like to greet all the executive members present, all the esteemed guests. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to this lecture. Uh, we are very honored to host uh, the Dr. Phyllis lecture, especially at this moment in time. Um, we are finding ourselves um, at a very uh, challenging time. Um, we are at the crossroads. Um, um, there is a lot that is currently happening in our country. Um, there is a lot that is happening in KwaZulu-Natal. There is a lot that's happening uh, even in our own university. But um, of particular concern um, for me um, as an executive in the university is, is, the, is the, the things that are happening, uh, the many things that are happening uh, around us, um, in our communities around us. There are so many issues um, of um, concern at a societal level that even us as uh, academic leaders, we're finding ourselves asking questions about what should be our role, how should we respond, how should we position ourselves. Um, we are finding ourselves asking questions about um, whose responsibility is it? Um, do we leave it to political leaders? Um, do we leave it to community leaders? Who do, who, whose responsibility is it? And uh, in many instances, we are not even able to meet each other in, in those conversations because of the circumstances that we currently find ourselves in. Many of these conversations are left hanging. And uh, we, we, we believe that it is really pressing that we engage in these difficult conversations. Um, KwaZulu-Natal um, came out of a very difficult time in, in July. And uh, for many of us, we, we are still traumatized by those experiences. Um, we are still wondering what they mean for the future. We are finding ourselves um, surrounded by uh, a lot more uh, impoverishment than we were even uh, finding two years ago. We are finding ourselves in an election period. Um, currently, a lot of people are asking questions as to how do we exercise our right? How, what is it that we do to, to protect democracy in, in this country, um, in this province? Um, there are many questions. Uh, many of them don't have answers. There is no single person from one single sector who is able to answer all of them. Um, many of those questions really require for us to put our heads together from different walks of life, from different schools of thought. And uh, we do need um, our young thinkers uh, in this country 
to help us think through these issues. We we need them to really um, because of the because of how they are so invested in the future of where this country goes. We need to create platforms to ensure that they can talk with us and share their uh, thoughtful um, uh, ideas uh, with us and they can um, help us uh, navigate the complexity that we are faced with, with a fresh perspective, with a fresh uh, lens um, so that we can begin to um, make some uh, inroads in addressing the complex issues that we face currently. I hope that um, you will agree with me uh, when I say that um, many people do feel disillusioned with the state of affairs um, in, in our country. And uh, it is really to many activists that um, we we send our gratitude over the many years, um, uh, many, many, many decades in this country who have contributed to the little prosperity that we have as a country, the freedom um, democratically that we have as a country. Um, but we still have many other challenges and we would like to tap in the wisdom of those who have come before us um, they, they, are, they are thinking, they are values, they are um, ways of life, um, they are sacrifices to, to draw some insights on how we might be able to uh, move forward, where we place our, our foot next. Um, because wherever we are going to place our foot is really going to determine uh, which direction we take. So with those words, I really wish to frame the concerns, the, the, the situation we find ourselves in today and welcome um, our, our, uh, this lecture, uh, this Dr. Phyllis Naidu lecture, that's really, uh, I'm really hopeful. I've been looking forward to it for many weeks and, and hoping that it will help to stimulate us. So no pressure. Uh, uh, Lukona, we, you know, we, we're very much proud of the men that you are, but um, I will not necessarily lie to you that the burden you are faced with is much greater than a burden you would have faced a year ago or two years ago, uh, given the, 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 the situation that we, we find ourselves. Let me welcome everyone and not waste any, any further time and really ask that um, we pay attention, we engage, and, and we take the ideas that we learn today forward in, in, in the many uh, walks of life that we have come from meeting here today. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, Prof, for, the, for that insight and kind words. Um, it is our privilege that you're actually present at this lecture today. Um, I'd like to introduce you next to Mr. Buck Whaley. He's the grandson of the late um, Dr. Phyllis Naidu, and he's just going to pay a tribute to her. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. All protocols observed. Thank you to the University of KwaZulu-Natal Gandhi Documentation Center for firstly hosting this memorial lecture in the name of my grandmother, Phyllis Naidu, and secondly, for affording me the opportunity to say a few words. My name is Buck Govan Deva Whaley. As the grandson of Phyllis Naidu, the nephew of Deva Das Paul David, the great grandson of Simon David, I realize I walk in many pairs of big shoes. This extraordinary privilege is not something I take lightly. In trying to work out what to say today, I had a few conversations with my mother. She reminded me that granny used to get very irritated when politicians would use the platform of a funeral and specifically the deceased to channel their own opinions to further their factional fights. So I'm mindful that as I try to explore intergenerational legacy, that I not invo invoke the images of my ancestors to beat my own drum. My grandmother used to make scrapbooks for my brother and I from the time we were born. 
Sadly, in those early years, we were not very interested and she was quite disheartened. Looking at them now brings tears to my eyes. She would take cuttings from the many newspapers she read every day and paste them into these books. As such, they are, they are a collection of stories and pictures which tickle her and which she thought would, uh, were important and or amusing for us to know. My, grand, my grandmother started life as a teacher. She was the daughter of a teacher. It is an instinct which never left her. When we, we being my brother and I, Granny Phyllis's only two grandsons were children, she used to write to us in the form of scrapbooks as if she was speaking to us, politicizing us and informing our consciousness to be interested young people. I want to share with you some vignettes from her scrapbooks to illustrate the deep humanity at the core of her being. On the 8th of June, 2000, she writes in a scrapbook to my brother and I of a picture showing three people, including the then Durban Metro mayor, holding spades as if to show the work they had done toward transforming Durban's N2, N3 junction. She writes, just in, case, just in case you thought the mayor, Mike Powell, and the two others with spades had dug the hole. Crap. Look at the back. The fellow in the blue overalls, he is the worker. Always they are given the back seat. In a separate scrapbook, in a separate scrapbook where Granny wrote little notes to me below a picture of the two of us, she says, how preoccupied you look. Who or what engaged your attention, we shall never know now. You certainly were not looking at your dad who took this photograph. Looks like he lost his shoe doing it. And here you are dribbling all over my hand. Your teeth were probably coming through. You bore that pain so stoically. Growing up is not easy, neither is growing old. Two ends of life, yours and mine. But it must be engaged and dealt with as much, with as much dignity as is humanly possible. I've been privileged enough to live most of my life in a free South Africa that is literally free of apartheid. I know that my grandmother was acutely aware that that was only the beginning, and I'm sure she'd have something to say about my use of the word free here. For what is freedom if you are hungry, I can hear her say. For what is freedom when state machinery is used to systematically violate people, to oppress the already oppressed, and to bring to the fore the dominant force of structural violence exacerbated by the inequalities further presented through COVID-19 and its subsequent lockdown. In 1994, when the ANC came into government, she rejected all offers of national positions. She wanted her feet on the ground. It was one of the highlights, highlights of her daily life, walking to the coffee shop around the corner where she lived on Ambila Road. All the people that she met along the way, from the Congolese cobbler to the security guards, she would speak to each one of them, listen to their stories of their lives, of harassment they experienced from police and other thugs, and about the struggles they experienced day to day. In the second year sociology tutorial group that I tutor, I try to remember the sensitivity, the sensibility to listen and learn from those around me, to learn people's stories, to learn that which informs people's lives. These are fundamental tools I use, and I believe they are legacy tools. As we are all acutely aware, the COVID pandemic has left many millions hungry. I feel safe in saying that my grandmother would have been enraged that relief funding for COVID has been stolen by her erstwhile comrades. I feel that she would have emphasized that a global public health disaster pays no heed to the individual and her freedoms. We are all in this together, good, bad, and ugly. To end off, I'd like to read you another snippet from one of, my, uh, one of the notes my grandmother, Phyllis Naidu, left for me. Here, she shares her love for the environment and perhaps offers a second to ponder the world from the things we see every day. She says, look at these beautiful birds, its colors, its eyes, its feathers, its beak, its legs. Some eagles can see fish in moving waters at great distances. You must study them, their peculiar features, and be able to tell them apart. Don't you wonder what birds are thinking when they fly up high in the skies? Thank you for your time, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Buckwhaley. Thank you for sharing your experiences with us and, and your insights into your grandmother. Um, UKZN is indeed honored to be hosting her collections in our 
Gandhi Latuli Documentation Center. We're in the process of digitizing some of that as well. So we are indeed grateful for that collection. Um, from here on, I'd like to um, introduce you to the facilitator who will take us through the rest of the program. And that's Mr. Joe Schlanger. He's the founder and managing editor of Behind the News uh, Network, and he's a geopolitical uh, analyst. He's appeared in many local and international television programs. Mr. Schlanger has written extensively on the war in Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, and the Palestinian conflict. So over to you, Joe. Thank you. Um, good evening to everyone. Um, I feel a lot of pressure uh, with the speakers that came before me. Um, but uh, it, it is very interesting times um, for us to find ourselves in this position. Um, and it's also uh, very good for the university to be able to document um, a lot of information and also to keep the family members, for example, for example, like uh, I like a lot of uh, words that came from back, um, you know, in 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 those days, he didn't really catch on what was happening until now. He started to experience what is actually happening now. He is part of the history. Um, he is part of what they were trying to be taught at an early age. And then God is alive now, he's witnessing the day-to-day -day running of the world. He is part of it. He is part of the history in making. So it's also lovely to honor those people who walked before us. It, it is also remarkable um, for, for, for all um, parties concerned uh, in this initiative. And um, when we spoke with uh, Teru, I believe that it was the right time for this kind of conversations to happen. And as uh, the professor indicated that as KZN, we came from, uh, in July, we, we, we didn't expect that, you know. Um, if you were to take it back, most of us who are alive today, firstly, we didn't think that the world would close. That was the first shock of our lives, that, everything around us will close. You know, other countries have been experiencing a lot of things, Iraq, Afghanistan, Palestine. There's so many things that are happening in those countries. We've been blessed to be in the position whereby, yes, historically, there were a lot of things that have happened, but it was not as bad as the world is closing we're in level five. People lost their jobs. Um, you know, when we were told that we are closing for um, 20, I think it was um, uh, 20, 21 days back, remind me, was it 21 days or 24 days, something like that. Um, we were hoping that the world will, will open and uh, there will be a change. We will go back to normal. Till today, we're not in that position. Uh, we have seen a lot of uh, things happening, um, politicians, taking advantage of the situation, the hunger that came with it, the diseases that came with it, the criminal element that came with it, um, the, 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 the hidden racism that came with it. The, the, so all that built into a situation whereby all sorts of things in our country that were the hidden issues, the, the, the opportunists, waited for this time to come so they can take advantage of it. We, we can go back to the 4th of um, July. The looting was something else. I remember watching from the aerial view of how people became normal in, in taking, how it was normalized, how it, 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 it was shocking. We never really thought we would be able to witness such events in our lifetime. We will watch these things in the screens, in the States, in, in many other countries where people become ungovernable in that matter. Um, but 
e, e, e as we stand now, there will be a lot of questions. In our previous conversations, when we did the book launch of Advocate, we, we, there were a lot of questions that were asked. We said, uh, as Professor also indicated, when election time come, there's so many questions that people are asking. Are those questions answered? Are all the things that the politicians are telling our people are real? Um, I saw one very disturbing picture of a political party walking into this house where you could see that there was nothing much in that house. The house is barely completed, but the certain individuals are trying to stuff in a t-shirt into this old lady that was sitting there. So the question that will come, are politics, is, is politics the right vehicle to change our people's lives? Do we need this kind of platforms for us to come up with initiatives to change our people? Why are we seeing a lot of rush fixing this, fixing that during the election period? Why are we becoming immune to the abuse of politics? Why are we now normalizing such kind of an abuse from the system whereby it does not necessarily cater for the people? Are these questions provocative to politicians? Um, we, we need to stop supporting political parties as, as soccer clubs, where uh, my dear soccer club case chiefs lost the other day and then they lost again last week, but I still support case chiefs. Can we change the way we look at politics and say, um, we want to now change the system, we want to change, we really, really sincerely want to better people's lives. So we're talking about jobs. Are politicians the right people to create jobs? Uh, the policies that they write talk to the needs of the people. Do we have political parties doing need analysis to our communities? Do we have politicians going to institutions like our, our, our UKZ and to have conversations to hear from the researchers, to hear from our academics, to hear from the students themselves, what are they experiencing? Or we just inherited a system that we just carry on with it? Or should we be fine with the fact that it's, it's, it's that animal so-called government? Because there's no accountability when you say government. How do we drill it down to say, okay, as much as when you deal with criminals, you are able to pinpoint, you did it, you go and save your time. You are being punished for what you have done. What systems do we have as a society to make the changes to say, we really want politicians to be accountable for what they are doing? I was having a conversation with a group of students and there was a question that came that uh, I was not able to answer. The students said, we have sport people, we have economics, uh, we have religious leaders, we have um, financial people, we have all groups, but why are politicians were picked to be the ones to run our affairs? Why are politicians uh, who decided that the, in, in, in all these groups, the grouping of politicians is the grouping that is supposed to be uh, making decisions on our day-to-day -day lives. Why not academics running? Because they're in the trenches, they're researching, they're collecting data, they're storing the data as we're sitting here in, in, in this platform today. We're sitting in an informed platform, in an informed environment. Why don't we have, why, why is the system not changing? Who benefits from the system when politicians are coming into the office and not delivering what they should deliver to the people? Who benefits from all of that? Who steered the policies of the party or of the government to suit them? And who decides on the, or, or, on the economic system that needs to be applied on that country? 
be it um, capitalism, socialism, communism, who makes the call to say capitalism is the right vehicle to change our people's lives? Meanwhile, on the other hand, on the other hand, it only benefits the few. So I don't want to take too much of, of the time, but I was just opening it up for us to think about it, to say, how can we move forward? How can we, we in spite of all these things around us, how can we make this society to work? How can we have politicians that are going to listen to us? How do we avoid things where they come to tell us what to do? But when it comes to voting, they want to negotiate. As soon as we vote them in, then they don't negotiate anymore. We've seen a lot of protests around the world because people are now starting to push back. Will it end well? I'm not sure. So I, I, I was just, this is something that has been out there, but we're not in a position. We're not talking about it enough because platform like this is not well welcomed, especially when it comes to the world out there, because some of the things that we tend to discuss is things that we're not prepared to hear. But the question would be, how do we change the system? How do we look at the issues of youth unemployment? Because as Hitler said, you capture the youth, you capture the future. Where, where is our future? UKZN is preparing the future leaders of tomorrow. Where are these leaders that you're preparing going to if there's no way forward? I'm not saying anything about um, old people. How do we have 80 something year old in parliament? Yes, we do need the guidance, but where is the room for you? You know, so I, I will just leave it here to also pave the way for, for our main speaker. He, he, he probably gonna touch on, on, on some of the questions that one had, but I must thank everyone for this opportunity to come and be part of these conversations and also to be uh, listening to guys like Bob, the professor, and, 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 and everyone else. It, it, it's nice to have people who came from uh, the families of people who are not to be part of us here today. So I will I'll leave it uh, back to you, Roshni. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you. Um, I think it's left now to ask Mr. Lukona Mguni to present his um, his keynote um, speech for us, please. Roshni, I haven't been on a Zoom in a while, so I, I had to find my bearings. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, introduction and uh, the welcoming from Prof. Musa Mushabela. Uh, thank you to colleagues at the University of KwaZulu-Natal who have joined the family of Dr. Phyllis Naidu, uh, all protocol observed because <clears throat> we're about to talk about a political leader in many forms, but who was much more than that. So I suppose uh, the politically correct thing is to observe protocol. I must uh, probably start off by sending my heartfelt gratitude to the University of KwaZulu-Natal and the Gandhi Lutuli Documentation Center for bestowing me with a moment to learn through this invitation. The task to deliver the Dr. Phyllis Naidu Memorial Lecture is no doubt a mammoth one. In her times, through her pen, mouth, and deeds, she spoke loudly for herself. Had she not, we would not be here today. What then shall we say about this luminary whose biography has been crafted beautifully by many who encountered her? Dr. Gregory Houston in 2020 wrote a chapter entitled, Phyllis Naidu, Yearning for Justice. Prof. Ronika Madeley was provoked by the 2019 event at UKZN's Edgewood campus that saw state-of-the-art facilities proudly named after renowned struggle icons and educators, Ellen Kuzwayo, Phyllis Naidu, 
and Dalshi September. Prof. Madalay went on to write a journal article entitled, Grabbing the Sharp End of the Knife to Bring Liberation, Peace, and Justice to South Africans. Lessons from Ellen Kuzwayo and Phyllis Naidu. When Dr. Naidu passed away, Nomondem Badi, then the, corporate, uh, the executive for corporate relations at the University of KwaZulu Natal, expressed her condolences on behalf of the university, saying that, and I quote, sincere condolences on the death of eminent author and activist, Dr. Phyllis Naidu. She went on to state that Naidu is most noted for her no-nonsense approach to life, a tenacious fighting spirit, and her immense sense of justice and compassion for the poor and destitute. Close quote. On Women's Day this year, Dr. Annie Devonish wrote a letter in the Daily Maverick, and she titled it, Dear Auntie, with love from Robin Island, remembering Phyllis Naidu. In this letter, Dr. Devonish illuminates memories, lessons, and constructed meanings from Naidu's letters written and received over four decades safely stored at the Gandhi Lutuli Documentation Center. Therefore, I am tempted to release all of us uh, to the center in a bid to read and exchange those letters. Probably it will do much better than me offering a lecture. That exercise would stretch us beyond the biographical sketches, few of which I have outlined and it would transport us to her autobiography, how she positioned herself in the world of her times, how she encountered her family, peers, and comrades, to how she made sense of the world in both subtle and overt articulations. Her biography, her autobiography rather, is rich because she shared it in writing, storytelling, and the interviews she gave, she gave. In this lecture, I will attempt to traverse history guided by Naidu's words, temperament and deep commitment to justice. I might not liberate you from your anxieties of the time visited upon by COVID-19 and other things that you worry about in life, simply because the journey to liberate is long and unending. Yet you will find encouragement, conviction, and deep contemplation in the legacy I am to discuss with you this evening. Many who have given this memorial lecture previously referred to anti Phyllis or comrade Phyllis. I have neither familial nor comradely familiarity with her. This evening, I submit myself as a student of Dr. Vasantha Phyllis Ruth Naidu, posthumous. My submission is delayed by the circumstances of time and space. After all, Phyllis Naidu was only three years older than my grandmother, who turned 90 in March this year. Submitting myself to Dr. Phyllis Naidu as her student becomes easy as I know the tutelage of my grandparents and it has never led me astray. <clears throat> Therefore, for today's learning exercise to be fruitful, I wish to borrow from Phyllis Naidu's autobiographical work where I encounter her in her own words without diluting interpretations. The idea of diluting interpretations is important to contend with because it challenges how we encounter and represent the stories of people who are no longer with us and therefore unable to correct our representation of them and their work. Biographical work must avoid, even if almost impossible, the trappings of diluting interpretations. The dilution is easily caused by the interpreter's positionality, 
at times their agenda, or in some instances, the lack of patience with the subject's autobiography before reaching conclusions. When we talk of Phyllis Naidu's work, we are quick to visit her encounter. Some say as a 10 year old, she says as almost an eight year old at the Institute of Race Relations Conference in Peter Maritzburg. The short version is that she was sent to go and call the boy at, at this conference. As an innocent child, she accepted the instruction only to be confronted by a realization that the boy is someone else's husband. Phyllis is said to have sobbed hysterically at the embarrassment. Depending on who tells the story, you at times read emphasis of the demeanor of the boy's wife who was encountered by Phyllis Naidu. Others say she was regal. Some say she was a dignified traditional Zulu woman. If you were to unpack what that actually means, you could encounter convolution in representation of the woman. Had she not been dignified, whatever that means, would her husband be deserving to be called the boy? I doubt it because one of the fundamental assertions from the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights is that dignity is an inalienable right, hence this right features so prominently in South Africa's constitution and case law. Dignity is not something we bestow or withdraw on people simply because of how they look. The point I am making is the risk of relying on biographical work of Phyllis Naidu in responding to today's conversation. <clears throat> that is because Naidu in her interview with Omali refers to the woman in question as, and I quote, an old African woman dressed in a long dress, close quote. Nothing about dignified nor being traditional Zulu. I have attempted to demonstrate how diluting interpretations can be found in biographical work. And if regurgitated enough, they become the truth and normative in understanding the philosophy and formation of political thoughts of historical giants such as Phyllis Naidu. Biographical work on subjects who are no longer alive has the tendency of interpolation, using the author's positionality, agenda, lack of patience or exposure to the subject's autobiography. Interpolation can be disruptive to the true narrative of one's subject if the author or interpreter is not mindful of the need to avoid inserting their estimations of who the subject was to a point of diluting the subject. At times, diluting interpretations are deliberate to use the legacy of someone such as Phyllis Naidu as a useful moralistic weapon, wherein associating with Naidu uplifts one's social standing, even if they do not live up to the values espoused by Phyllis Naidu in her life, times, and autobiographical work. I shall return to this weaponization of legacies in my conclusion. For this lecture, I have relied on two pieces of Phyllis Naidu's autobiographical work. An interview she conducted with Padraig or Padraig Omali in 2003, kept in the Nelson Mandela Foundation's archives, and her acceptance speech in 1995 when she received her honorary doctorate from the University of Durban, Westville, now of course part of the University of KwaZulu Natal. The speech is published in the 1860 Heritage Center. Just from these two pieces of work, we learn that Naidu's archives, Naidu's archive is vast and sits with multiple institutions that have the difficult task to preserve and curate the memory of our multi-layered past, which in many forms intersected in the life of Phyllis Naidu. The sub-themes of my lecture 
are all things that Naidu encountered in her life. Remember that my lecture this evening has been entitled Unemployment, Poverty, and Social Unrest During COVID-19. Now, these for me at least, have all intersected in Phyllis Naidu's life and I shall demonstrate very shortly. Unemployment is something that features in her indentured grandfather's lived reality. His, her grandfather was part of the indentured labor from India. But it also became her own reality following her banning in March 1966, as she could not work productively to generate her own income. Poverty is her household's maneuver, as she stated in 1995 that her father, Simon David, was a teacher who, with, and I quote, a salary of four pounds a month, took care of 10 children, a Catholic wife, grandparents, and an aunt with five children, close quote. This led to Phyllis pronouncing at that graduation ceremony, clearly miracles do not live in the Bible alone. She was correct. How some people survive the unrelenting vicious cycle of poverty in the sea of unemployment engulfing South Africa is nothing short of a miracle. Social unrest in Phyllis Naidu's time was a product of the existential crisis of oppression, dehumanization, and brutality of the colonial and apartheid systems. Naidu encountered some of the worst instances of social unrest, including a moment that could have taken her life when a puzzle bomb was sent to Rev Reverend John Osmas in 1979 in Lesotho. Osmas lost a hand while Naidu and others were injured. <laughs> By 1983, it was clear that the apartheid government would kill her. She had to go and thus she fled Lesotho. Some of her comrades died in the December 1985 Maseru raid by the apartheid regime. Had Phyllis remained in Lesotho, she may have perished there. Her counterpart, Dalshi September, did not live to tell her story as she was assassinated in Paris, France in 1988. There are no greater effects of social unrest than these, including the assassination of Phyllis's son, Sadan, in Lusaka, though some records say this happened in Tanzania. I will rely on Phyllis Naidu's autobiography as authority. She says in a speech, it was in Lusaka. <clears throat> the recent social unrest witnessed largely in KwaZulu-Natal and Gauteng pales into insignificance when compared to the brutality of colonialism and apartheid and the social angst they generated with massive disruption in communities and people's lives. I know the organizer's intention was to use the life of Phyllis Naidu as an entry point in contending with today's topic, unemployment, poverty, and social unrest during COVID-19. I hope I have started to demonstrate continuities of what is happening in South Africa with the lived experiences of Phyllis Naidu. One is tempted to point at COVID-19 as a discontinuity that Naidu did not live through a pandemic. <clears throat> However, if we look closely, Phyllis was born 10 years after the outbreak of the Spanish flu, which claimed over 130,000 lives in South Africa by the end of 1918. She must have been born into a society still grappling with the after effects of the pandemic, reportedly more devastating in its effects than COVID-19. 
There is not much discontinuity if we appreciate the fact that Phyllis was 20 years old when apartheid was formalized into governance in 1948, and she outlived that crime against humanity. She was 66 years old when South Africa held its first ever democratic election. Naidu was there when South Africa was grappling with its response to HIV and AIDS, an epidemic that has claimed so many lives, often countless children, and continues to be a social disease we are struggling to arrest. Therefore, in July 2021, Various forms of social unrest ensued in South Africa, commanding global attention. Trucks were torched, highways blockaded, stores looted, racially motivated killings occurred, and many other permeations of lawlessness and criminality were witnessed. The president of the country, Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa, stood boldly on the 12th of July, addressing the nation and acclaimed, and I quote, this is not who we are as a nation. This is not who we are as a nation, close quote. Many had pronounced in similar fashion that this is not the South Africa they know. There was a flurry of condemnation of these unrests, but the looting went on to a degree until there was nothing to loot in some communities. I was not surprised by these events. If anything, I was surprised at how they stayed contained in two provinces, possibly pointing to the confluence and immanence of politics in the motive forces that gave rise to so deplorable yet unsurprising acts. For a long time, we have warned of four persistent problems that compromise the viability of a sovereign state in South Africa. I will limit myself just to four. The first issue is a ticking time bomb. This term has been used to refer to the large number of young people who are not in employment, education, or training, accompanied by high levels of unemployment among the youth, exacerbated by high attrition in the secondary school phase, poor architecture of the post-school education and training system, and prevalence of social ills such as drugs and drug and alcohol abuse. Some have even called this a lost generation of youth, a worrisome assertion, because in a country wherein the youth makes up majority of the population, you might as well speak of a lost country. Are we a lost country? This can be a lecture on its own. Allow me to move on. The second issue I want to deal with is a lack of social cohesion. We have not dealt adequately with the intersectionality of race, gender, sexuality, and class in our society. As a result, there are multiple lived experiences that are antagonistic to one another in South Africa. Failure to reconcile our society leads us to permanent conflict. The lack of social cohesion leads to social exclusion. Unfortunately, in our society, the excluded are the majority, a continuity with the times of Phyllis Naidu. The idea of social exclusion is best captured in a paper delivered by Professor Paulus Zulu at a conference of the, of the, of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences in 2017, which I had the pleasure of attending at the Vatican with Prof. The paper was titled, the etiology of social exclusion. I quote from the opening literature review he conducted on this topic. <laughs> and this is what he said. In the Weberian sense, social exclusion or social closure 
refers to the process by which social collectivities seek to maximize rewards by restricting access to resources to a limited circle of eligibles. In socio-political terms, this implies that the excluded have no access to a certain basic standard of living and to participation in the major social and occupational opportunities of society. This is an instance of active and constitutive exclusion where the purpose is to close social and economic opportunities to outsiders with the nature and extent of closure, determining the general character of the distributive system, close quote. Now, in KwaZulu-Natal, this lack of social cohesion led to the Premier, Mr. Willis Mkunu, appointing a special committee on social cohesion. Broadly speaking, there are issues of violence, xenophobia, and racism in KwaZulu-Natal. At the heart of issues are race relations between Black people and Indian people. This is something we shy away from discussing for sheer political correctness. But we know it exists even within our professional settings where people organize themselves, not only as friends in exclusionary circles that accord to their race, but also as a closed network for career advancement and upward social mobility. And these follow what Prof Zulu wrote about, to close social and economic opportunities to outsiders, which in this instance are racially defined. When the Phoenix massacre happened in July, 2021, I was not surprised. The state, because of its limited capacity, allowed private citizens to defend themselves. In a racialized society as ours, the economic interests are intertwined with racism and those who were seen as a threat to the economy during the unrests were largely black people. This opened black people to indiscriminate suspicion and in turn senseless violence. Our pretense that this lack of social cohesion and its manifestation into social closure is not a problem will lead to more explosions of racial tensions and senseless killings in future. Let me move on to the third issue that is a threat to our country and its sovereignty. It's what I call irresponsible politics. <clears throat> this phenomenon fuels our problem because demagoguery politics are employed by political entrepreneurs who seek to benefit from persistent divisions in society. Instead of being conciliatory, they polarize. Instead of choosing peace, they stoke violence. Instead of negotiating with their foes, they retreat to silence and pretend as though they are unaware of the problems. Irresponsible politics were at the heart of the July unrest, with senior members of the African National Congress admitting that their own factional material interest was spilled over into society. It is tempting to say this is the same organization that Phyllis Naidu gave up her life and enjoyed pain and suffering for while giving up on a normal life free of brutal physical terror from the apartheid regime. Of course, all people suffered because of apartheid, precisely because Apartheid was more than just grotesque violence. It was a structural crime against humanity. But I think you get my point on what Phyllis Naidu gave up. The truth is that Phyllis Naidu did not suffer for the ANC. She did so for our society. Hence, we must be able to speak of Naidu's legacy and values outside of the ANC, 
as it was for our total liberation to build a South Africa fit for all human life. The threat of irresponsible politics cannot be emphasized enough. Today, we meet with just under six weeks before the local government elections. We need to make political choices that return rational, balanced, compassionate, and responsible politics to the center of our political landscape. By responsible politics, I am considering politics that call for political ideology, actors, and programs of action that center humanity's holistic advancement in material, spiritual, and consciousness construction. The fourth and last issue I want to deal with that is a threat to South Africa's uh, sovereign viability is poor governance and statecraft. Again, something that is befitting of an entire lecture on its own. Therefore, I shall be brief. As the unrest unfolded in July 2021, it became clear that we lack competent intelligence, as in intelligence services, not that kind of intelligence. The state was ill-prepared to respond. Given our levels of inequality, poverty, destitution in our society, and how often we have spoken about the ticking time bomb, we must be prepared for any negative manifestation that has been observed in the world as a result of these structural challenges. Our statecraft operates on chance than intention. We have no leaders with a compelling vision for society at the present moment. Yet leadership is possibly the most pivotal ingredient to escape the state of angst and flux we find ourselves. To achieve this type of leadership we so desire, we need unassuming, visionary, and most important, passionate leaders as Dr. Phyllis Naidu was. <clears throat> you meet her humility in some of the stories you hear about. I'll tell you a story that was narrated to me by my good friend, Songezo Zibi. It's a fascinating story. Songezo lost his uncle in 1982. He was exiled in Lesotho and died there. At the time, Phyllis Naidu was still in Lesotho. Song as I went to speak about this or was having a conversation with his friend Sudhir Matai about his uncle's death and how the Zibi family hoped it could fill this blank page about the uncle's last years of life. As fate would have it, Sudhir knew of Phyllis Naidu as they were family friends. Sudhir connected Songezo with Phyllis. Wasting no time, Songezo with his nephew visited Phyllis. They arrived on one Saturday at about 10.30 a.m. only to leave Phyllis's home at about 6 p.m. Songezo said to me, Phyllis was incredibly warm. Many people went into exile as young boys and she became a surrogate mother to many of them. Zibi told Phyllis about his uncle, but she did not know the name Vuyani Zibi. Now at this point, you can imagine that Songezo believes he made this trip from Johannesburg to Deben possibly in vain. <laughs> However, Songezo took out a photo of the uncle and Phyllis stared and she blurted, this is Vito. And that's because according to Songezo, Phyllis knew these youngsters by nicknames or their nom de guerre. So homely was the visit to her home. Songezo and his niece, I mean his nephew, 
did not only just get to hear about their uncle Vido, they forgot they were visitors and started raiding Phyllis's fridge as well. She even cooked for them. Song as says of Phyllis, she had done a lot, but was modest about it. That's his impression. She went on to some box to look for pictures in hope that she would find pictures of Songezo's uncle. To Songezo's shock, some of the photos that Phyllis had kept were photos of corpses. And you had to look through these corpses now to try and get to the uncle. However, this is really a story about how Phyllis Naidu had a fantastic memory about the youngsters in Lesotho and where they came from. We call this a personal touch. Phyllis was also with a great sense of humor, even in the midst of troubles. If you didn't know, she used to smuggle high blood pressure tablets for Governor Mbegi through George Nika. Mbegi's comrades at Rivonia, which unfortunately now the Lily's Leaf is really closing down, which is quite a sad story. Uh, so when they were still in hiding in Ravonia and operating from Ravonia, Mbegi and his comrades took a liking to the pills, these high blood pressure pills, and it gave them great relief. Phyllis, reflecting on this, must have been proud of her impact because she writes, little wonder they did not kill themselves. <laughs> she must indeed <laughs> have come to their rescue, having pilfered enough from hospital surgeries, as she says they did. When Mbeki and his comrades were arrested at Ravonia, Phyllis was relieved. And this is what she said to her colleague. Eh, Ronnie, what a break. The racist government had to find the tablets from now on. Listen also to how she starts her interview with Padraig Omali. Omali says, Phyllis, just for background, maybe you could tell me a bit about yourself. Phyllis responds, what for? Omali says, because I'm interested. She says, well, what do I say? I'm 75 years old. The rest is history. If you read that interview, it's available online. You really get a sense of a beautiful, beautiful reflection about the history of our country and where we come from. Let me attempt a conclusion. <clears throat> the concept of justice should haunt us when we remember Phyllis Naidu. We might not belong to the same organization, but the pursuit of a just society should make us belong to a collective solidarity fund that is committed to the restoration of humanity. Ultimate liberation from the bondages of unemployment, poverty, and social unrest will not entirely be achieved in our lifetime. However, we have a generational mission to make a significant breakthrough that builds on the gains accomplished by Phyllis Naidu's generation. The democratic breakthrough may have been imperfect, yet it endowed us with a foundation to express ourselves while at the same time, it gave us reprieve from unrelenting day-to-day -day brutality, brutality of the crime against humanity that was apartheid. The legacy of apartheid remains with us, subliminal in the expression of structural racism while screaming at us in the intergenerational vicious cycle of poverty that is proving difficult to break with the colonial and apartheid spatial architecture becoming impossible to reverse. Naidu would be disappointed at the lack of commitment to social justice by the elites who claimed her as their comrade. These elites are now helpless. They possess state power to build a new consensus in our society for the next breakthrough. 
but they are so entrapped in their own greed, corruption, patronage, warped sense of social mobility, and that and what success looks like. Phyllis Naidu perhaps would have helped us to steer them in the right direction. I feel guilty making this assertion because it is to burden the spirit and memory of Phyllis Naidu as though she left us with unfinished business on her part. We must state boldly that Naidu did all that she could, gave all that she could give, and must rest knowing we remain generationally indebted to her struggle for freedom. Someone might say, how do you know she would have stood for the right thing? Well, we know this because Phyllis Naidu lived 19 good years post-1994. In those years, she proved to be incorruptible, selfless, a committed student and teacher, while unshaken in her quest for ultimate liberation. I dare say she died with her boots on the ground, a true operative in service of humankind till the end. Today, her comrades are stealing from the poor. Her comrades steal money earmarked for life-saving personal protective equipment as we navigate COVID-19. Her comrades flesh their ill-gotten gains as proceeds of hard work in the face of skyrocketing unemployment and unabating poverty in our society. Her comrades are often around when she's being remembered, and maybe some of them are even in this Zoom call, and they are comfortable to even speak and remember Phyllis Naidu. These comrades of Phyllis Naidu avail themselves to her memory because they no longer possess a conscience, nor is their revolutionary morality still intact. If they possessed a conscience, Bebezo Banamasoni, Uguti Bakulume, or Phyllis Naidu, Babebazi, Uguti Bayanjonj. Naidu would never have accepted that the fight for liberation that came at such great personal cost was a ticket to loot the very state that is meant to be in service of all South Africans, not the few politicians. In fact, in 1995, receiving her honorary doctorate, Dr. Phyllis Naidu stated, and I quote, we should say with equal empathy that the disgrace of the squatter camps around here has no place in our society. By the way, she was talking about the University of Deben Westville, today's Westville campus of UKZN. The squatter camp called Guapanana or a banana is still there. And she went on to say, not only do this not have a place in our society, that we will not rest until the jondolos are replaced with proper homes. Do I have a yes on that one? I am sure she got a good applause of agreement. She goes on to say, a better life for all is our slogan, not a better life for any ethnic minority, not a better life for you or certainly not for me, but for all South Africans and I close quote. Tonight, I put this question to you. How can the John Dolos be replaced when Phyllis Naidu's comrades are stealing money intended for human settlements, for water and sanitation, for local economic development? At what point does poverty become eradicated when Phyllis Naidu's comrades are tightening the chains of bondage on the poor with their visionless leadership that lacks conscience and a clarity of conviction for the liberation of all South Africans. They speak the language, but have no commitment to action their words that, care, that carry fluffy promises. For this reason, today, we are compelled to state that 
These are no longer Phyllis Naidu's comrades. Their continued association with her legacy will achieve nothing but contamination of a life so well stayed in service of our liberation. I know I'm giving a difficult parting shot to the organizing committee of this annual memorial lecture, but Phyllis Naidu never shied away from difficulty. Instead, she relished such moments. Protect her memory, guard her legacy, and be vigilant to ensure that people who no longer serve the strategic ambitions of a just society can no longer call themselves comrades of Phyllis Naidu. They are not. They must be prevented from using the legacy of Naidu as a robe to cover the naked emperors they have become. That is the only way we will fight unemployment, poverty, and social unrest in a time of pandemic by choosing the best among us to lead and chastise those freedom fighters turned modern day oppressors of our society. Phyllis Naidu would demand this of us. We owe it to her. I thank her, I thank her for the lessons she has granted me through this lecture. Engosi ngiabonga kyalebucha. So, um, thank you so much uh, for the words. That was Mr. Lukona Mgoni, who is currently a PhD candidate of political science in Kwazul Natal. We have uh, had him on different platforms. We have had him on the radio, mostly on Power FM, SABC have been using a lot of uh, his contributions um, in terms of a way forward. Um, thank you very much. Thank you once again for, 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 for those words. I just wish um, those kind of words were out there for, for, for people to be able to consume this kind of information. You have touched on most of the things, most of the questions that one had. Um, I, 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 you, you gave us a lot to think about. You, you gave us a lot of wisdom, a lot of depth through uh, uh, Dr. that we're honoring today, uh, Dr. Finis. Thank you very much. Um, I think the, the, I was advised that the, there will be questions, there will be hands that will be coming through so we can take the questions while uh, Mr. Mguini is still on the platform so that he can somehow outline or answer some of our questions that we might have. So I'm um, opening the platform for questions that um, people might have, might want to um, pose to Uputi, Mr. Mkona, Mguini. Thank you. Is there anyone with a question out there? Unmute your mic and come through. Um, good evening, everyone. Joe?
Good evening, good evening, come through. Ah, uh, can you, do you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, look, Connor, thank you very much for that very, very um, beautiful um, presentation uh, in memory of a Dr. Naidu. But my question, as an ordinary citizen, as a young man, beyond just um, the voting, what else can we do as a society, as a people, to, um, do it to mitigate the kleptocratic uh, behavior of um, the politicians um, that have become overnight superstars at the expense of poor people, uh, people who do not have a voice? What can we do as a people beyond just sitting in Zoom meetings, but what can we actively do as a people? Thank you. Mr. Mgwen, would you like to um, come in answer one by one or you would like to sum them up? Uh, Joe, if we can take two perhaps or three, it would be helpful. Okay, thank you. So we can have the, the next uh, question coming through, ladies and gentlemen, while we still have the last bit of minutes. And if no one is coming through, I will give uh, Upoti Ungo need to come through and continue. No, thank you very much. And thank you to uh, Usnabo for, for, for that uh, question. <clears throat> and, I, and I suppose it's a, it's a fair question given where we are. And um, a call to action. How do we get to call to action? I think one is to build the habit of telling these uh, overnight superstars you talk about uh, masquerading as politicians in our society, how much they are wrong to do what they do and hold them to account, whether it is by making sure that we mobilize against them through various forms and not just by the vote. So there's the concept of how do you follow the vote in between the five year period? And I think we need to do serious work of building a critical mass that speaks truth to power a critical mass that holds politicians to account where we do not turn a blind eye when an injustice is being committed. We call them out, we report them, we get them arrested and prosecuted for some of the things that they do wrong. But we need to also start exercising the institutions that are there as democracy building institutions. How many of you have ever laid a complaint with the South African Human Rights Commission? How many of you have written to the public protector? How many of you have petitioned the provincial legislatures and our parliaments? I'm not talking about things that need money such as litigating against politicians. What have you done to access the available chapter nine institutions at our disposals as citizens to hold power to account? These are some of the things that we need to do because the question about leadership has a tendency to think that we are going to find ready-made leaders who can replace the current lot that is not serving us well. Does not work like that. Amongst ourselves, <laughs> and this is why black consciousness was so important. Start with the consciousness, raise the awareness of your material condition, propose a program of action on how to liberate yourself, build a critical mass behind that program of action, and then subsequently, take over because you would have formed yourself to that which you want to see in society. I think we've got a really long road ahead of us and the time is not on our side. Thank you very much, Jay. Okay, thank you, Lucan. I saw Alfred um, and Vincent. Alfred, you were the one to come through first, uh, shoot. Uh, good evening. Uh Hello, Alfred. Can you hear me? Can you? Yeah, we're struggling. But... Uh, Alfred. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Shoot, my brother. Uh, good evening, Tanubungalala no Babu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My question is more of what is happening in our country. Would Babu Yaya yeah, yeah, agree that 
the problem in our country is political appointments. Perhaps if we can change that and give uh, portfolios to people who are qualified, for example, a minister of health being a doctor by profession and a minister of education being a teacher by profession, someone who knows what he's dealing with. Maybe the issue of intelligence also come with the problem of appointing people who are not really on intelligent academically. So I want to know what Babu Yeye is thinking on that. What is his take on that? Thank you. Uh, Mgoni, come in. Uh, Alfred, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, uh, because I'm an academic, evidence is the best way to go to. There was a minister of health not long ago who is a doctor by profession, has given the Dr. Phyllis Naidu lecture previously, Dr. William Kieser. He could unfortunately not rescue himself from being entangled in the digital vibes matter. Mm. This tells us something, that our problem is beyond political appointments. Our problem is what Prof. Olelamangu called once a corruption of values in our society. We are at a space where you can appoint the most intelligent people well-versed in their fields. However, absent of values, they will still not do the right thing. And this is why I called in the lecture for what I call responsible politics, which is about political ideologies, actors, programs of action that are about the holistic advancement of humanity. And if we accept that values, such as those I related from the likes of Dr. Phyllis Naidu, need to be returned to our politics. It's so dangerous having clever criminals in your midst because they operate and they pillage public resources so sophisticated. Mm. We need to move away from just demonizing political appointments and talk about the core problems, the absence of values, both in those who appoint and those who are appointed. And this is why it is important, as I said, perhaps to return to the philosophies of black consciousness, because if you're still from poor people, you probably lack a sense of pride in yourself and the collective humanity. And therefore, the first thing, if you read liberation theory, True revolutionaries, whether you're talking about Cabral, Che Guevara, one thing that they centered, and one thing that is centered in the story of Phyllis Naidu, Charlotte Makeke, the likes of Dalshi September, is a deep, 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 deep love for their people. The current Lord that leads us has no love, neither for us as a people, nor themselves. Because if you loved yourself, you'd never endanger your life to such an extent that as a pensioner, you must be in and out of jail, or as a pensioner, you must be in and out of courts trying to avoid imprisonment. Because during your time, you did not live as Phyllis Naidu did, and therefore you cannot sleep well at night. Thank you very much, Alfred. And Vincent. Vincent, are you there? Vincent was supposed to be having a question. Yes, uh, I'm here. I, I hope you can hear me. I think I've, I've tried to, to wrote my question here on the chat. Can you, can you all hear me? Okay. Yep. That's good. So my, my, my question is, uh, thank you for the presentation and the, it's a nice talk and very much empowering. The, the question I want to ask, because I heard in your, in your speech is that um, we need to identify the right leaders. 
you see, and, the, and, and, and one thing that really comes to me is that uh, so many of the leaders have actually betrayed us and betrayed the people. And we identify them in the beginning of the struggle, hoping that they would do uh, right and, 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 and do the things that really meet our need. What else we can do uh, to mobilize the society? Because I, I think now what, what I believe is that I think maybe we need to go back to the local communities who have been left unorganized so that they become organized and hold these leaders accountable uh, and be active in doing so. And I think it is very important now in the context of this um, incoming local government election so the, the question I'm asking is what, what, what else we can do now to mobilize the community so that it's really structured to hold these leaders accountable and know that um, li liberation and democracy does not just uh, begin and end through voting. There is more that they need to do to, to, to govern with these leaders and hold them accountable. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, thanks. Yeah. I, 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 just, I just want to say, communities are organized, but we misunderstand how they are organized. On the first day, I'll make an example. On the first day of the rollout of the vaccination program for COVID-19 in South Africa, in one metropolitan municipality, Mangaung, Bloemfontein, they could not roll out the vaccine, I think for two days, because there was the Mangaung shutdown. Now tell me what more organization do you need than an entire community, an entire town, might not be everyone in the town, but some people organized themselves enough to make sure that there is a shutdown and no movement. And this had, there was no looting, there was no banning of trucks and what, people were just organized. Look at how the Alex shutdown happened before the 2019 elections. Now, the point I'm raising is that to a great extent, some communities are well organized. What we probably need is a group of people that will start being consensus builders across these spaces of communities on the fundamental question of one, the kind of life that we need. My colleague, Dr. Stembilembete at the University of Pretoria asks this question this way. What constitutes a good life or what should constitute a good life for a South African? Once we answer this, we must look among ourselves and ask, who are the best placed people to give us this? Now, you will never achieve political consensus in the sense that everybody uh, will, will move like sheep uh, trying to cross a road even if a truck is coming. It doesn't happen. Society is not like that. And that diversity in society that helps us pull, pull in different directions is important. However, it becomes problematic when it is toxic, when it doesn't serve the common good and the ultimate vision for a good society. But communities are organized. If communities were not organized, poverty would be killing a lot of people in South Africa. Because communities are organized, they are able to feed each other. They are able to avail shelter to each other. They are able to avail spiritual and psychological mentorship and counseling to each other. Otherwise, our rates of suicide, high as they appear in the recent study released, would be far higher than they are. Society, South African society is abnormal, and therefore its outcomes should be abnormal. Look at the levels of gender-based violence and femicide. Not everybody who is a survivor there gets to report, gets to get some form of help from the state, often than not, they revert to their social circles, to their families, friends, and other networks that they have. So in fact, it is how society is so well organized
that South Africa is still a fascination to many scholars around the world as to how with all the levels of inequality that we suffer, we are not experiencing violence in the manner in which we should. Because if you were to simulate inequality and where we are and destitution and where we are, unemployment and where we are, the simulation tells you that there should be far greater social unrest in South Africa than there is. The only thing standing in between that and our condition as a society is how well organized communities are. The disruptive effect of COVID-19 is to start weakening those bonds of solidarity and chains of uh, people being together. And if COVID-19 persists the way it has, in the waves that it has, and people don't vaccinate as the likes of Prof. Musa Mushabela have been imploring us as a mechanism, not to eliminate COVID-19, but to try and, and, and at least lessen its devastation in our society. Eventually COVID-19 will break the chains of solidarity within communities. And these organized people who are providing security for South Africa, once they lose their cohesiveness, all hell will break loose in this country. And that's why when the social unrest happened, when communities stood up, we started seeing a dampening of the violence in some, con in some situations and a, an avoidance of eruption in others. So the point I'm making is that communities are organized and unfortunately, the ways in which I've described at which they are organized, if we don't find ways to strengthen them in the face of this pandemic, when those chains of solidarity break in our communities, There'll be death from poverty, death from suicide, death from unabating unrest, death at a, at a spiritual and psychological level, which will probably uh, reverse any gain we have made as a country since 1994. So our condition as South Africa is extremely urgent, and I hope that we will take it with the seriousness that it deserves. Um, um, I see Saziso Shongwan, and before we get to him, I just want to ask um, um are politics the right vehicle to make the changes in our society? Pack it one side, let's go to Saziso Shongwan, but I would like you to keep that in mind or that question. Are politics the right vehicle to make the changes? Because politics seem to be paving a way for all these things that uh, Udo Tanaidu did not stand for. So what are we to do? Majority of, of the questions that will come from especially the youth, which other vehicles that are there to change our lives? When we come out of the uh, tertiary institutions, is the platform fertile for us to be able to move ahead? Hence, myself and yourself who agree that without the youth, we are doomed because we have nothing that is supposed to carry us forward. Let me give you, as a social one, an opportunity to come through. Okay, uh, do you hear me, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay, okay, yes. No, in fact, my question is about the uh, definition of uh, youth in South Africa. Um, when you look at uh, political parties like the NC, it says that youth is a person who's uh, 35 and below. The IFP says it's 45 and below. And we normally, uh, in certain later cycles, they talk about 18, 21. Insurance companies, they will tell you about 26 if you're still studying. I do not understand which one is academically close to uh, uh, the, the, the scientific definition of a youth person. Um, and I've got a problem with the uh, youth unemployment being the main narrative uh, in our country, especially because in the uh, unrest that we had here in Wazul Natal and Gauteng, they had people that lost their jobs. Let's say, assume that, for example, the definition would say a person who's a youth is a person who's 45. That means that a person and, and below. If a person is 46, that means that person will now have what we call a decrease in labor market attachment because that person will take longer to get employment because he's not prioritized. We're looking at the youth unemployment with this uh, definition that limits 
um, uh, people that are above that particular age. But anyway, maybe uh, there is an academic definition that will be more inclusive, that will take a, quickly, a more reasonable uh, ages. Because in South Africa, a person to take a pension, to stop being a, 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 a working adult, at least a minimum of 55 years. Thank you. I, I will, I'm tired, I'm good. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. I think there are a number of questions there. Um, let's start with the definition one. In fact, South Africa's range of definition of youth around the ages of 15 and 34 is probably a very advanced and highly encompassing because the United Nations definition is between 15 and 24. We add 10 years on that to 34. Now, different countries for various reasons, which at times also take into account what we call uh, the population's age structure, will define youth in different ways. And quite correctly, as Saziso is saying, it has, uh, you know, considerations for longevity in terms of labor attachment and so on. Some countries are much more aged than others. Some are more younger, especially in the African continent and all of that. But let's deal with the fundamental issue that he's talking about, the absence of opportunities and the ease of working people out of opportunities. I have this <laughs> conversation with my cousins who are now on the wrong side of 35. And they say, but Mtasa, it means na and this ukashwa because the prioritization seems to be those who are young people. Well, as I said in the lecture, we've spoken about this ticking time bomb. Necessarily so, you need to prioritize youth into labor market entry for one reason only, to lessen the extended burden on the state in years to come. So it's about forward and future planning. I'd rather put in work a 30-year-old today who still has 30 more years to go before they qualify for the old age grant than put a 40-year-old, if I had a choice, now I'm talking about making a serious choice, than a 40-year-old, a 45-year-old who's much closer to the social grant than the 30-year-old. Now you might say that is unfair. It's only unfair in the context we find ourselves in because they are limited to no opportunities for some people. I spoke about the problems that give rise to that. Prevalent social ills, attrition in the, post in the secondary school, a poor architecture of our post-schooling education and training system. We need to fix all of these things simultaneously. If we are indeed to open up as many opportunities to society as possible, what will not work is what is contained in the now withdrawn green paper of the Department of Social Development. Taxing the already super text and text out of their minds, people. Sometimes we wake up burdened by just the reality that we will be taxed so much that we might not even see what we wake up and go work for. So the idea of a 12% for social security and retirement is really not going to work. But the need for security at an old age level is going to be a very important one. And how do you secure a youth that is going to grow as this massive cohort of unemployed or underemployed people? Where do you find security for them? Because they wouldn't have worked productively to bank for their own retirement. So it is necessarily so to prepare for greater absorption of the youth in the labor market today in South Africa, given our age structure of the population, but our lived reality about the future that we want. And if you don't secure the future of the youth today, what you are going to end up with is exactly what I'm warning against where our conditions of poverty, unemployment and destitution will start being the cause of our death as a society which will affect our longevity expressed in terms of age expectation or expectancy. Once you deal with a decreasing 
age expectancy, you are going to have a problem wherein you are unable to really plan properly for the future that you want. So I want to suggest that that be uh, our approach in understanding. But the desire is not to lock out anybody who is fit enough to be economically active. Not a single person should be locked out, but we've got serious challenges. Last but not least, Joe, are politics the right vehicle? They are, they are, they are, they are not the only vehicle, but they are an important vehicle simply because the global consensus is to organize ourselves as sovereign states around the concept of government. And the concept of government largely relies on the participation of political parties and people participating in those. So political participation as an enshrined constitutional inheritance from the, life, from the work of the likes of Dr. Phyllis Naidu remains a significant responsibility that we must safeguard in our society. Certainly there are other ways. Civil society is thriving and beaming with young people doing all sorts of things. The private enterprises beaming with young people going into the financial tech space, young people who are entrepreneurs, young people who are brokering ideas in the agricultural sector and so on. However, if our politics continue to be irresponsible, all of that will simply collapse because the logic of a strong, healthy, good government is still what governs the world over. And we need to be committed to that until such time that humanity has transitioned into another consensus. But for now, we are still within the trappings of the logics that prevail globally. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I want to put on the spot. Is it the right vehicle? Well, it, it could be an academic question, which we might not exhaust here. We must deal with both. This is the, this is the thing, uh, <laughs> what, we call, what we call praxis, demands of yeah. us to be theoretical and, and operate in a realistic world where we are, we are being practical. The practicality is that it's one of the most important vehicles to shape and move society. Because through politics, you get public representations, through public representations, you elect governments, through that you formulate policy, and that in, informs whether you get investments, whether you get development, whether you get social advancement. If you look at countries that have had sound politics with the right actors, right ideology, and right priorities, such as the Scandinavian countries, we may talk about the problems that they have, but generally people there live a good life, even you and I can go and study for free there in some institutions and just pay our living costs. You can never have that in South Africa. Probably UKZN, in fact, is one of the few universities, even at a postgraduate level, that offers a remission of tuition fees for masters and PhD if you are full time. Other institutions charge money even for those, though that they receive research output grants from the state, they still charge money for those. So the point really is that the sense of a good life is quite intertwined with the right set of politics, not alone in concert with all the other issues on the environment, social, economic, and other forms of operation. But politics, because they give rise to governments, they remain a centerpiece of what is important for any country. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mgoni. Thank you so much. Um, this conversation is much needed. Uh, we'll request uh, from UK that then to create another platform so we can explore more. If there's, uh, I see uh, Sinabo, uh, who else is there? So we can wind it down so we can get our chairperson ready to come through. Uh, Sinabo, please come through. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's me again. Um, you know, look on. I'm listening to you and I'm reflecting on the conversations we had during level five and four. Do you remember the midnight conversations about the response of the state? Um, the reality is that our country, everything when they do politicians, uh, apart from um, being bankrupt and so far as ideas are concerned, everything they do um, is actually a new jack reaction. It's a knee-jerk reaction. Case in point, the recent um, unrest, 
so they'll tell you that you had the intel, but you didn't do anything. So they act retrospectively, which is shameful in every sense of the word. So that, that's a statement, one. But how do we influence policy change, apart from going to those institutions that are infiltrated by politics? How do we influence change? And the second question, Prof. Mashabella, is actually to you regarding vaccinations, understanding from a public health uh, perspective. Wouldn't it have been better when they opened the vaccinations, they said everyone should go and vaccinate as opposed to going by age group by age group. I can understand from um, a perspective of people with comorbidities, but to sort of circumvent the, um, the reality of vaccine hesitancy, wouldn't it have been better for them to say, if you want the vaccine, go for it? Because from where I'm sitting, it looks like there's... Um, there's a program or a, a program to try and eradicate, which we all know that it's just impossible from a public health uh, perspective, just like any uh, pandemic. It does not automatically go away immediately. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Well, Joe, let me go first so that uh, I give Prof. Uh, Mushabel a chance to go. Look, I... Uh, Snabo, it's, 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 it's a fair question, but you know, <laughs> let me tell you what I have decided to do personally. I don't know about other people. I have decided to spend less time lobbying for policy changes to people who don't understand what I'm talking about. I have decided to spend less time advocating for policy changes in a context of people whose ears are shut by greed and corruption and patronage. Therefore, <clears throat> I think the, the, the imminent task that we have, all of us, is to persuade each other that we need new politics in the form of electoral reforms as mandated by the Constitutional Court in June last year. And we need to work very hard to push politicians, and, and I know they are going to resist, they are resisting, to push politicians to electoral reforms that we think will achieve a sense of more accountable politics, but also politics and public representation that gives greater voice to people and communities in parliament. The second one is to think through what new politics do we need, both in form of organized politics and political education in our country. And we, and we work hard at this, we broker them to society so that we can start seeing leaders who listen when we talk, leaders who understand when we talk what we are talking about, and leaders who are persuaded enough to buy into what we talk about. Currently, advocacy, um, as much as it works sometimes, it works, I won't lie, it works, but very few times, and partly because we lack those leaders with a compelling vision for our society. Joe Msanga, thank you very much. Thank you to your team. Uh, thank you to colleagues and everybody who stayed with us this evening. Prof. Musa Mushabela, I'll leave that other one to you. Uh, you speak uh, very great and fondly about these things, and you've been a great deal of service to our country. So I must also just uh, thank you uh, before I shut down and listen to the closure because I think my part is done this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Through you, Joe, let me just quickly uh, say that, um, Lukona, we cannot have you feeling jaded already and uh, getting tired to speak to people who you feel are not going to listen to you. We still, you still have uh, many years ahead of, of you of advocacy and activism. And so we, we need to make sure that you don't get tired. Uh, you can take a break, but don't 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 give up at all. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you. So, th thank you so much for that question, Snabo. Um, and I I think that uh, you know a, a few months ago, actually sometime last year, I said to someone that we're going to need a a commission of inquiry into our COVID nineteen response, and they laughed at the time. Uh, but more and more, I think that. Uh, you know, there, there's so many things in hindsight we can see that we could have done differently in many ways 
what we say in public health is that uh, when you're dealing with an emergency, it's very important to act. Um, and, uh, you know, your actions may be right or wrong in hindsight, but what's important is to act quickly. Um, if the, those actions are informed by some sort of sense, logic, evidence, um, then we accept them. We, we could always look, uh, go back and say, these things could have been done differently uh, from lessons learned. But um, I, I do want to say that I think uh, we are going to find later on when we look back, especially when we are out of the, the, out of the danger, that there are so many things we could have done differently. And I think that conversation is probably going to be needed in order to prepare us for the future or to prepare generations after us uh, for their own future. But I do want to say that at this point, I, I think that uh, the decision to follow that logic of uh, different age groups, in my view, was a reasonable decision, um, given the context of limited numbers of vaccines and stock. And, and it was a risk adjusted. And so I, I would accept it, even though I agree with you that we could look at it and, and find different ways of, 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 of doing things. And you will see later on, there's going to be a lot more things that we will pull out in, from this experience. I, I do want to just mention that um, in terms of, you know, the issues of leadership, the issues of corruption and so forth, it is really important for us to make decisions in the interest of our youth, whatever decisions we make. Um, and, and I agree that to some extent, the decision around um, the age categories was a, a little bit of an injustice, to some extent an injustice to our youth, um, but um, our future as, as a country will be secured by ensuring um, that we, we, we think and make decisions and, and invest in the best interest of, of our youth, including having to think about how to ensure that they live longer, healthier lives, because it is on the backdrop of their long lives that we can build a legacy, a legacy for this country, a legacy for future generations. So, so these are, are conversations that I'm sure we are going to have when we reflect on this experience. We have, this is our only, and I think Mr. Mguni said this, that we, we are living through a pandemic that um, generations that uh, came before us have not lived through. Um, and so it, it is a new experience. And so we're going to draw a lot of lessons from it. Let me stop there and thank you, hand over to you, uh, Joe, um, and, and, and thank you for the question. Much appreciated. And once again, thanks everyone, including um, uh, uh, Mr. Dayanandan, who has been listening from Chennai. Much appreciated. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Um, this was much needed indeed. So if there's no other question from the floor, uh, I don't see any hands, I don't see. Uh, I would like to ask um, the captain of the ship, uh, our chairperson, uh, Advocate Zandi Lekono, to come through and do the closing for us to do the honors. We would not be here without your leadership. Uh, we must thank you very much for affording uh, the opportunity with your team and everyone else who has been behind uh, this. So uh, I would like you, Captain, our leader, to take us through from here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Um, can you hear me? I'm sure I'm audible. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, just, just a, a point of order, Joe. Um, advocate is a verb, and the only title that is given to advocates 
um, is that of SC, and that's you that is affixed to the end of the name. So just as a point of order. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm tasked to give the vote of thanks on behalf of the uh, advisory board of the Gandhi Latuli Documentation Center. So thank you. Our sincere gratitude is extended to all of you for honoring and responding to the invitation. Um, I'd just like to give special thanks to Professor Moshabela, who is the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research, as well as Dr. Roshni Patha, members of the executive management, and of course our guest speaker, uh, Lukona Mguni, for that very instructive and honest lecture. I think there's a lot that we have taken out from there, um, which is going to make us reflect um, particularly on the life of um, Aunt Phil. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Buck. It was lovely to see you, um, as well as family and friends of uh, uh, Aunt Phil, members of the Senate, academics and professional staff, Thiru Munsami. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether Pamela Adams is here. Um, they are always putting in, uh, uh, they are the ones that are responsible for the success of all our events. Uh, alumni, students, political, business, and religious leaders, uh, veterans in the struggle for, for our liberation. Um, I see Dr. Betty Govan was here as well, uh, commenting in the, in the comment section. Um, the media, members of the advisory board, my fellow members, thank you very much. Um, Thiru tells me that there have been about 320 responses to uh, the invitation. And I think that's a testament to the good work uh, that the center has done over the years. Um, ordinarily, we'd have uh, a bit of socializing at the end of the lecture. Uh, unfortunately, COVID has put us in these positions where we are at um, behind a computer screen. Um, but I'm hopeful that we'd be able to, to do so uh, in the year to come at our lecture, at the next Dr. Phyllis Naidu lecture. And um, just remember, guys, that this would, of course, be dependent on us vaccinating. Uh, I certainly look forward to the next engagement. So on that note, everyone, we, this is the end of today's program, and we can leave the meeting. Thank you, everyone.